My guest today is Dr. Charles Hoff, a rural physician in Lytton, British Columbia, and one of the first doctors in Canada to speak out against the mRNA COVID vaccines. We discuss what he discovered shortly after the vaccine rollout, his persecution as a consequence of ringing the alarm over what he saw, and his upcoming trial with the BC College of Physicians and Surgeons. Charles Hoff is one of the few doctors who honored the Hippocratic Oath and alerted the public to the danger of this large-scale experiment. He's nothing short of a hero, and I can think of nobody more deserving of your attention for the next 90 minutes. Stay tuned. Dr. Charles Hoff, thank you for your time today. I, I, I've been looking forward to this conversation, man. Thank you, James. Uh, thank you so much for including me on your show, and, and I'm looking forward to speaking to you. Yeah, well, I uh, your story is very close to my heart. I, I'm from British Columbia, uh, originally from the Vancouver area. I vacated a couple of years ago and came to Alberta after everything I endured out there over the last, you know, five to 10 years. And uh, but I was aware of your story very early in the vaccine rollout. Um, there were a number of people in my circle who pointed me to you and said, hey, there's this doctor in Lytton who's been speaking out and uh, you really need to check him out because he's, I mean, we were in BC, you were pretty much the only guy bringing the alarm. So I want to start with your story. Um, can you talk about, let's let's talk about your work as a, as a medical practitioner in Lytton, uh, the community that you serve and, uh, and, and your experience during the vaccine rollout. Yeah, absolutely. So, so right off the bat, so I'm a, um, a rural family doctor, also doing emergency medicine, um, which I've done since coming to Canada in 1990. I did my medical training in South Africa, but I love rural medicine. I like being a generalist. Um, I don't like city life because I, you know, hate being stuck behind somebody else's car. I I, I like the open road. I like space, and, and so so I'm a rural guy, and and I love the First Nations people of of Canada. So I have been in this little community, which is probably 70% First Nations. And they are the Nlakapma people of Southern British Columbia, and they are fabulous people. And, and so that's who I've been serving since I came to BC in 93. I started off in Northern Manitoba, serving the, the Cree and the Dene up there. Uh, but, but so that's, that's what I've devoted my entire career to is mostly serving the First Nations people. So, when this when this pandemic hit, I real I, I it was not hard to see it was being massively over exaggerated that that the risk of harm was being hyped out of all proportion. I mean, there were there were there were indicators really early on that this was not a lethal disease, you know. And, and one of them, of course, was that that, that cruise ship uh, called the Diamond Princess. Uh, which you know who had a passenger with covid that was literally i believe in january or february of 2020 and so this was like a a brilliant um laboratory sample of a whole lot of elderly people and, and this cruise ship had a thousand crew and and and, and about 3700 people in total and so we knew from that cruise ship which was like because they were all isolated we could see how many people were going to die and what age they were and of course, you know, the average age of those that, or the median age of those that died was 81 on that ship, and only seven people out of the 3,700 died. So we we could see, and they were all very frail elderly. So so it wasn't hard to see really early on that that the media were not being honest, and that the health facility, the authorities were not being honest. And so when they said we were getting this new uh, messenger RNA based vaccine. I, I did my job as a doctor where, you know, doctors are supposed to practice evidence-based medicine, which means you need a good scientific basis for every decision you make and for everything you do. So I started looking into the history of, of these uh, gene-based vaccines, and I found there was absolutely no evidence of safety. I, I found that after the first uh, SARS virus, which also came out of Wuhan in China, but that wasn't in 2002, and it sort of seemed to break out again in 2003. Um, they tried to develop 
a, a vaccine against that. And that was far more dangerous than this. This That had almost a 10% mortality. COVID had a, a, a less than one in a thousand mortality and all of those were in the very frail elderly. So when I saw that their previous efforts to do this had were showed that it was neither safe nor effective, and these were purely on laboratory animals, I had no hope for safety for this. And so when I then heard that there were no animal studies being done on these, that they were literally seemed to be pretending to test it on a, on, on a sample of relatively healthy adults for a couple of months and then said it's good to go, with no pregnant women, no children, um, this and then said it's good to go for everybody. Uh, this made absolutely no sense. So I was watching for problems. And and when the vaccine rollout first started in my community, I was actually away for, for, for a period of about six weeks. And I came back um, and, and my patients then, so 900 of the First Nations people had been vaccinated in the first first sort of wave of the vaccine rollout in, in our community, which was in January of 2021. And when I started seeing what these shots were doing to them, I was horrified. And, and so I started speaking out right away. I was given a gag order by our local health authority who told me I was not allowed to say anything negative about these vaccines in the course of my work. And, um, and, and that if I had any concerns that I must not talk to my colleagues about it. I need to, to contact the medical health officer in charge of the vaccine rollout. So when I started seeing what was happening, I sent this person a, an email letter to say, this is what I'm seeing. Please, can you tell me what disease process has been initiated from these injections? Because I've never seen this before, and I do not know what the diagnosis is, and I have no idea how to treat it. And of course, there was no reply because they didn't know that they were saying this was safe and effective. And, and the early things I saw were all neurological problems. So these are people with nerve damage. Uh, the, I would say the commonest symptom was perpetual pain. And the pain could literally be anywhere from, from head, face, right down to feet, limbs, testicles, um, chest, pain everywhere. Each patient was different. Every patient was different. There was no pattern to it, but it was nerve problems. It was pain. It was weakness. It was altered sensation. It was dizziness. Um, that's what I was seeing initially. So, so I then sent an open letter because when I realized that, th that the public needed to be alerted to this, uh, doctors have an ethical obligation to protect the public. And I realized that the public was being deceived. They had been coerced with fear. They'd been told that this was safe and it was clearly not safe. And so I sent an open letter to Dr. Bonnie Henry in here in BC, who is our provincial health officer, telling her basically what I was seeing in my patients, giving her the exact numbers of how many had been vaccinated and how many people in my practice were now disabled since their vaccine. And at that time it was six. Um, as a way more since then, that was very early on. And those people, I was seeing them literally three months after their shot and they were, these symptoms had not resolved. So that letter caused a huge problem for the authorities uh, because this was blowing their cover of safe and effective. And, and so literally uh, about a month after that, every college across Canada put out a warning to doctors everywhere that you are not allowed to spread misinformation about these vaccines. Um, because, you know, anything that they don't agree with, they consider to be misinformation. Uh, and so, so that was, that was a, a crucial tactic that they were doing because they were basically censoring freedom of speech in the medical community. And they were warning doctors um, that they would be punished and, and disciplined if they do not toe the line. So this essentially wiped out um, informed consent. If, if a doctor is not allowed to tell a patient about the risks of a certain treatment or product, that patient cannot possibly give informed consent. So it wiped out informed consent, it wiped out freedom of speech, and it effectively created a sort of an illusion of 
of sort of agreement in the medical community that people thought, well, obviously all the, the other doctors don't have an issue with this because they're not saying a word. Well, they'd been warned not to say a word. So this created an illusion of consensus. And so so we'll talk later about my trial that's coming up, but 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 one of the things they accused me of is not of being out of line with the rest of the medical community. But so that's what they did very early on following that that letter. Um, they created this illusion of consensus in the medical uh, community. And so, so I was then put in touch with a vaccine safety specialist who I asked, you know, the same questions um, about. So Dr. Bonnie Henry didn't reply to my letter. She put me in touch with this vaccine safety specialist who gave me a telephone meeting, who told me that all of the problems that I was seeing in my patients couldn't be from the vaccine because it doesn't do that. And, and so these must be all coincidences. And, and, and I said, well, and, and they kept saying, you know, well, we really just need to get a diagnosis. And I said, well, absolutely. So will you help me with that? Will you, will, because I had been phoning around to all the large hospitals in Southern BC, trying to find a neurologist who would see these patients urgently to figure out what was happening, because I simply didn't, I'd never seen this before. And and I phoned three tertiary hospitals that are that that I've sometimes sent patients to, including the two biggest hospitals in Vancouver. And every time I would speak to the neurologist and tell them what was happening, they would just go quiet on the phone and say it wasn't their field, and they just wouldn't touch it. They, they, the doctors were terrified of implicating this vaccine in anything. And so I said to the safety specialist, I cannot find a neurologist that will even assess these patients. Please, can you help me? We need to know what's happening. This is a serious public health issue. And they said, no, we can't help you. Just fill out the vaccine reporting forms. I said, I've already done that. They said, just, just fill them out. Anyway, they, they, the, the, this, this safe vaccine safety specialist, her advice eventually was, well, just don't tell the neurologists it's from the vaccine. Cover that up. Just tell them this is a person with these problems and, and don't tell them it's from the vaccine, which is absurd. Yeah. I mean, if you're giving somebody a new experimental medical treatment and they've got terrible problems from it, you can't ignore what caused it. This is this is craziness. Yeah, man, there's so much there. I mean, I found it was incredibly telling that in the, you know, in the spirit of equity they put first nations communities forward to take the vaccine first right like it was it was framed as well to be equitable we're going to give you know people of color and first nations communities the first crack at this and it's like well you're obviously exp using these people as the t crash test dummies for this experiment of yours right um well and, and their rationale was that these these are people who are at risk because some of them have, I mean, many of them have, have other medical problems, perhaps, perhaps higher than the rest of the population. Um, and, and so they were targeted, but it, that troubled me enormously, that First Nations people. It was First Nations people and the medical community that were aimed at first. And of course, the medical community was all to try and get to show, well, we're giving this to, you know, because all of their crazy restrictions were to protect the healthcare system, you know, that that they kept telling us was on the verge of collapse, when actually, in, in, in fact, the hospitals right across Canada had been quieter than they'd been for decades. Uh, and it was all media hype. Uh, but um, anyway, I, I interrupted you. No, uh, yeah, no, I, I had a friend who was a, a ER nurse. And he told me, so I guess they do seven to seven shifts, right? And he said that he would get off his shift and people would be banging on pots and pans and clapping for him as he walked to his car. Little did they know he had been sitting there on his phone for 12 hours because nobody was going into the ER. It was it was dead quiet, as, as you said, right? And so... um so you you were guilty really of the crime of being a good doctor that actually cared about his patients. You were one of the rare few in the healthcare system. You see, in Canada, our system, at least as a as a guy who's been a patient of the system, 
it often feels like a like a faceless machine like they're just there to diagnose a problem prescribe you drugs get you through the door i mean that's i, I think that's kind of one of the faults of our system it's 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 not there's no humanity left in it so a doctor like you who actually cares about his patients sees something happening sees these people are 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 in, you know terrible pain you start making phone calls and of course now you're calling the system, ask, asking this machine to care, and they just don't. They just didn't, right? And and that's that's your crime. Your crime was caring and ringing the alarm about something that you see, you know, potentially snowballing into a bigger problem. Um, so how did you treat the the people that who were having these symptoms? Were you able to treat them with anything to to help them at least get through it? Yeah, well, at that point, I didn't know how to treat them. Uh, it was literally just symptom control because I didn't know what had happened. And so th th that that letter that I'd put out there where I set out the number of vaccinated, the number of injuries, what the symptoms were, I set out all the details in that, that went around the world. And so that connected me with some fantastic doctors in Europe and across Canada and the US who gave me a really good idea to because because nobody knew what these things were actually doing i mean we knew that heart attacks and strokes had gone up but these were not heart attacks and strokes um th there was something there was something else and this was very early in the vaccine rollout so so when uh, dr byron bridal revealed that pfizer knew that these vaccines go intravenous in a very short space of time. They don't just stay in your arm like a normal injection does. The delivery system, putting it in little lipid nanocapsules was literally designed to take this thing into your brain, into your lungs, your heart, your bone marrow, your reproductive organs. It takes it everywhere, which, which in fact explains the incredible diversity of vaccine injuries. It's, it's literally everything you can think of this thing can do because it literally goes everywhere. So it'll hit you at your point of weakness. So, so when we did, when, when, when it was revealed that this thing goes intravenous, literally within 15, 20 minutes of your shot, you've got these, these things in your bloodstream going in everywhere, including crossing the blood brain barrier. If you're pregnant or cross the placental barrier, it's, it, it was a delivery system designed for chemotherapy that takes it everywhere. So knowing that and knowing then that this messenger RNA is going to be absorbed into the cells around your blood vessels. And because of most absorption happens in capillaries, those are the tiniest. These are these networks of tiny vessels where the blood slows right down. So that's where gas exchange can happen and, and, and nutrients and, and, and other things going in and out of cells. So I then realized that that's where most of these spike proteins are going to get made in the cells around your your blood vessels that's the, called the vascular um, uh, 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 endothelium and so so it was sort of predictable that clots would happen because these spikes are rough they're spiky and they form part of the cell membrane so which is how they were supposed to create antibodies y your body makes these the, the the RNA is a is a, a gene sequence to make spike proteins. Your body makes the spike proteins. The spike proteins get incorporated into the cell wall and they stick out as a little spike. And so your immune system then recognizes this foreign protein that's part of your cell wall and thinks, whoa, this is not supposed to be there. This is not a human protein. We need antibodies against this to kill this invading organism, which is how it would interpret it. That was, that was how these things were supposed to work to make antibodies. The trouble is the spikes are in your blood vessels. And so when a platelet comes along, it's only, it, it's completely predictable that a clot will form there because this is now a rough spot. It's not smooth anymore. And that's what platelets do. They detect damaged vessels and block them. That's what stops you bleeding. So knowing that the, these clots were going to form, but that most of them were going to be microscopic, um, I then started doing a blood test called a D-dimer test on my patients. And I started saying to my patients, I'm trying to figure out what these shots are doing. And I'm concerned that they might be causing microclotting. 
Can we do a blood test called a D-dimer test, which you need to have before and after your COVID shot uh, to see what changes, but to get what you, get your baseline before and get one a week after. And so I started doing this on my patients. And literally, uh, I think when I got the first eight people's results back, and more than half of them had evidence of microclotting. Now, these, these were people that had no evidence of vaccine injury. These people thought their shot went fine. Maybe they felt a bit tired. You know, maybe their arm was a bit sore, but nothing serious, nothing that out of the ordinary for a vaccine. And so when I realized that that, that more than half, and in fact, out of those first eight, it was five out of the eight, which is 62%. I was absolutely horrified that of the number of people who were getting blood clots from this, who had absolutely no symptoms and no idea. And of course, the fact that they felt very tired or maybe had a headache afterwards probably meant those blood clots were in their brain. But I knew the clots were tiny. They wouldn't show on a scan. They're just too small. And they were occurring in, in more than half the people. So I mentioned this in an interview just as a preliminary finding. And I was hoping to get hundreds of people to do this so it could be published as a proper scientific study with big enough numbers. And when I, I spoke up after I got the first eight, because five out of eight had evidence of clotting. And, and so, I mean, tragically, so that then took off around the world, that little clips from that, that that video was subtitled into all sorts of weird languages that I can't recognize, but it, but it, it really alerted people all over the world to these microclots. So that then doctors in other countries started doing D-dimers on vax injured people and finding that they were massively high, that, that these people were all clotting, you know, and, and, and so anyway, tragically, we had a terrible fire about, I think it was nine days after that interview where my practice burned and our town burned and the lab burned where the tests were being done and everything burned. 90% of our town was wiped out by that fire. Um, and so that, that was sort of the end of my medical practice. It was the end of my D-dimer research. And when I finally got the last of the results, and because there were results that were out pending that I hadn't got the stuff back. Um, and eventually I only got 15 people to do it, but more than half had evidence of clotting. It was, it was eight out of the 15. So, so those are small numbers, and that's why I never published it. I didn't think it was a big enough numbers to be statistically significant. But this is a huge safety signal. And, and so um, it's now, you, so you asked, how, how did I treat these? Well, at that point, I had no idea what to do. But, but ivermectin has turned out to be a brilliantly important drug. And, you know, Priya Corey wrote the book called The War on Ivermectin because they literally was a war against it. Normally, the colleges never tell doctors what medications they can or can't use for any treatment. I mean, literally, if a, if a medication is a licensed, legal, um, approved medication in Canada, a doctor with a medical license can use it for literally whatever he wants. And in fact, up to about 20% of prescriptions are what we call off-label prescribing. So in other words, you know, we can use things that we might otherwise use for treating blood pressure, we can use it for treating nightmares, you know. So, so the, many medications have many applications. And, and ivermectin, so, so doctors aren't normally obliged to only use a medication for what Health Canada has approved it for. You can, you've got a brain and scientific knowledge and a medical license you can use that medication for anything as long as you've got a good scientific basis for it. But for the first time ever, BC and Alberta colleges issued a warning to doctors that they were not allowed to prescribe ivermectin for COVID, which was which was really weird because they'd never told us that we could we're not allowed to prescribe a medication for a particular thing before. This was they desperately did not want people to use ivermectin, and it turns out that ivermectin is, I mean, has 20 mechanisms of action uh, th that are significant for COVID. And five of those are anti-inflammatory pathways, but one of them is this way of literally binding those spike proteins to stop the clots. And so people with long COVID or people with the 
vax injuries are often and and people with with shedding as well you know because shedding is where you inhale spike proteins from somebody else's breath um and it can can make you sick for those people that are very sensitive to spike proteins you know fortunately a lot of people are, are not and they seem to be able to handle it but ivermectin literally binds those spike proteins to stop them causing the clots mm. and and that's why it's so effective in people with covid pneumonia you know covid pneumonia is a is a condition where you get microclotting in your lungs and that's why their oxygen levels drop so low and the ivermectin literally binds those spike proteins to prevent that so so that's also one of the accusations we can talk about that the different accusations that they have against me one of them is for telling people to use ivermectin to keep them out of hospital well we weren't allowed to do that so anyway yeah well i i'd say so far i have you guilty of three crimes uh one caring about your patients and doing everything that you could to try to help them two uh doing actual science as a medical doctor are you crazy you're a medical doctor you don't do science you just prescribe drugs and send them out the door and hope for the best and i would say three Prescribing an off-label drug that, you know, the mainstream media told everybody was horse dewormer and a veterinary medicine that nobody, that no human should ever take, even though it's saved billions of lives and won a Nobel Prize. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you're in this, you know, uh, situation where you're behaving as the doctor that you've always been and you're treating people and you're trying to help them. Now, I do want to ask, because you... You mentioned earlier, you know, people feeling pain in different parts of their bodies. Is Was that, in your mind, attributed to where the lipid nanoparticles were landing and where the, the spike proteins were being uh, built uh, within their bodies? Like, would that would that be would that pain be attributed to that process or would were you never able to make a connection there? Well. So the people that I've got, so I have people in my practice who got their first COVID shot three years ago and still have daily pain from it. So for those people, I believe they have developed a, a medical condition called small fiber neuropathy, which is actually an autoimmune problem. The people that had pain the next day, terrible headache or 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 um, or I have people, you know, with pain in their limbs or pain in their neck or chest pain or abdominal pain. Or I had one, one fellow who told me his testicles were really painful for about a week after his his second shot. And, it, it, you know, the shots were, weren't all the same. So it not each one did the same amount, but, but clearly the damage was cumulative. And so the more shots you got, the more likely you'd get, get injured. But Initially, I think the pain was inflammation from those spike proteins, which were highly inflammatory. They are th th that spike protein was developed. It's a patented bioweapon. It was designed to harm people. And so putting it into a delivery system that literally took it to every part of your body is just the most evil thing imaginable. Mm -hmm. And then giving this to people who had been primed with fear, who were terrified of this coronavirus. Um, who were convinced if they got COVID, they would die. Um, it, it, it was just so evil to, to tell these people, this will keep you safe from this terrifying virus and then giving them this something that literally puts these spikes everywhere. And, the, you know, it's interesting. Most people don't realize the trade name for the Moderna vaccine is spike vax. And all of these people who got um bell's palsies and 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 i mean i have a i have a patient that got five cranial nerve neuropathies a bell's palsy is a, a cranial nerve neuropathy of the seventh cranial nerve that 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 paralyzes or partly paralyzes half of your face so the cranial nerves are nerves that come straight out of the brain and 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 serve functions in the in the face and in the head that don't come out of your spinal cord because most of the rest of your nerves come out of your spinal cord everywhere from the neck downwards and are distributed through your body so so these people were getting their brain spiked or their nervous system spiked with the spike vax because most of my patients got moderna some got pfizer but most got moderna and so i think it was the inflammatory probably the inflammatory nature of these spike proteins 
causing the nerve pain initially. Wow. And so I spoke to Naomi Wolf and she has assembled a team to go through the Pfizer trial data for the for the mRNA gene therapy vaccines. And the the trial data itself is about 450,000 plus pages long. And so she put together a team of 3,000 experts, journalists, doctors, scientists, basically everybody that she could grab and, and had them read through it. And what she found is in, in that trial data that there is almost a singular focus in the study on in the study of the effects of the mRNA vaccines on the human reproductive system. And they've found just absolutely horrifying things. I mean, as it relates to uh, fallopian tubes, um, you know, the female reproductive system. They've also shown uh, Pfizer knew that the mRNA vaccines were degrading male testes um, and a lot of times uh, um, in utero. And so uh, they they found um, uh, Pfizer knew that babies were having, were seizing, some were dying after breastfeeding from, from vaccinated mothers. Uh, women's menstrual cycles were being thrown way out of whack. Uh, that a lot of the lipid nanoparticles were collecting in the ovaries, thus, you know, sterilizing a lot of the the women. Pfizer knew all of this stuff before the vaccines rolled out. And um, I, I wanted to ask you, have you had a chance to look in any of this? Have you heard about any of this at all? And, and if you have any thoughts on it? Yes, I, I have. And, you know, the fact that Pfizer did not want to disclose any of that stuff for 75 years speaks volumes. And the fact that the FDA in the United States assisted them and supported them in not releasing that safety data for 75 years speaks volumes. So Pfizer holds the record for the greatest criminal fine in history for concealing harm. And I think that was over their drug called Vioxx, if I remember correctly, which was an anti-inflammatory drug, which was very effective for osteoarthritis. And they concealed the evidence of harm from that. Now, Vioxx is now taken off the market. But but unfortunately, Pfizer and, and the whole pharmaceutical industry have the most appalling track record for scientific fraud and dishonesty and concealing evidence of harm. So, so none of this is surprising. Um, these people... You know, one of the things I've learned as, as, as a doctor down the years is that the the biggest predictor of future behavior is past behavior. Usually the things that people have done in the past will be fairly predictive for what they do in the future. So if somebody has a long track record of dishonesty in the past, unless you have good reason to believe that they have been utterly transformed in some wonderful way, they're going to do it again. Mm -hmm. And it's just, yeah, I mean, I, that's only logical. Um, a leopard doesn't change its spots, and 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 that's what we've seen. So we know that the the World Health Organization, the United Nations, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have all three of those organizations have used vaccines in the past in third world countries to reduce fertility, and they have done them under the guise of other vaccines to keep people safe. And they've done it in Brazil, I believe Brazil, Mexico, India. Uh, they did it in Africa and Kenya. There's another country I can't think of. But they've done it in five countries around the world in the past where they have given people, especially usually women, um, vaccines that wipes out their fertility. And... So the United Nations has been fairly honest about the fact with, with Agenda 21 and Agenda 2030 that they would like to reduce the world's population to 500 million. We're now almost 8 billion. So that means six, 15 out of 16 people need to be eliminated. So, you know, HIV, the HIV, which was another patented virus, I think has only killed about 30 million worldwide. So that didn't work very well. Um, but of, obviously, if you can wipe out fertility, you can really make a big impact 
uh, in the world's population. And, and the fact that they were so determined to vaccinate children and even babies, yeah. knowing that COVID was almost no risk to them. Do you know there hasn't been one single healthy child under the age of 16 that died of COVID in this entire pandemic? In four years, not one. And yet the fact that they're giving this vaccine to kids down to the age of six months is absolutely absurd. And so it, 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 it's scientifically illogical to vaccinate them with an experimental gene therapy thing for which there is no long-term safety data, absolutely none. To protect them against a disease that poses no risk to them is very sinister. And this is the only logical conclusion is that they're trying to wipe out the fertility of these children. Um, because, you know, as, as I think most people perhaps know that when a female child is born, it is born with all the eggs in the ovaries that she'll ever have. Guys make sperms from, from puberty onwards. They make sperms every day, every minute. They're making millions, billions of sperms. But girls don't. They are born with a quota of eggs in their ovaries, and that's all they will ever have. And, and once they've used up those eggs, obviously with every ovarian cycle, they, re, they release a couple. And, and, and once they're used up, they're done. But if you can wipe those eggs out or, or reduce them substantially through something like a spike protein before that child even reaches reproductive age, that person is infertile. And, and you know, that's... Uh, that is just evil beyond imagination to to tell parents you will keep their children safe yeah. and then use this in that way is it's just hard to imagine that these psychopaths do that and and you know the Pfizer's Pfizer's own biodistribution study when you look at the top four organs in the body where where Pfizer knew that these um this vaccine ends up the ovaries were in the top four the top four it was it was liver liver spleen bone marrow and ovaries were the top four destinations for where these spike proteins will end up so the fact that they know that and they're giving this to babies and children and anybody of reproductive age is is hideously evil it's so evil that it's hard to comprehend and it's, it's stunning. You know, I, I'm a writer, I'm an essayist, you know, I, I hang out with stupid people, you know, we can all sit around all day and talk about the new world order and, you know, conspiracies, but to hear a, a doctor of your esteem say the things that you're saying, I mean, it's, it's stunning, right. To a point where it's, you almost can't believe that a guy as brilliant as you are, that cares as much about, your patience and humanity in general, as you do, is saying the things that you're saying, right? Yeah, no, this is, we live in an evil world where unfortunately evil people do evil things, but but the scale of this, you know that they've now administered more than 13 billion COVID shots worldwide. Yeah. Do you know that 70% of the world's population has had at least one shot? And of course, they're not, you know, there's still some people who are going back for their sixth and seventh yeah. that haven't woken up yet. I um, mean, you wonder how many times they've had COVID and whether they really think this is <laughs> helpful. They usually say, well, I didn't die. So therefore, it's working. It's really protecting them. You know, they have to say, well, and, and so how many of your unvaxxed friends are dead from COVID? You know, and well, they don't want to talk about that. Um, but but the, 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 the scale of this evil is is just mind-blowing it's 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 gigantic and it's it's like i said it's 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 hard to fathom right because it, you know we're here it's like our, the the world just flipped upside down on us just out of nowhere right and i think a lot of us are still trying to uh you know reconfigure our compass and figure out like which which way do we go here Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, for me, it was clear very early on. Right. Like you were one of the people that popped up on my radar radar early. And I was like, look, if, if this is what they say it is and if this is 
if this is see with the ivermectin thing I, I i always felt you know you would hear well there's there's no randomized control trials look if we're in a pandemic if we're in a panic scenario right what do we do we find the doctors who are treating this thing successfully we figure out the drugs that they're using what they're doing create a protocol roll it out everywhere it's that simple if we're in a real panic scenario you don't need randomized control trials. You need to find the doctors who are administering the drugs that are working, figure out what the what what combination of drugs they're using, and then just go. But that was clearly not the case here, right? It was they were clearly trying to obscure and cover up drugs that were actually working. And ivermectin became, you know, along with hydroxychloroquine, the the, the those two became, you know, I mean, they became the devil themselves, right? They did. And, you know, Doc, we, we knew that ivermectin had antiviral properties 10 years before this pandemic. So it wasn't an unreasonable thing to try. We, we didn't know about these the spike protein before the pandemic because it hadn't been released yet. You know, it was a new thing that came out of a, a bioweapons lab. Um, but, but hydroxychloroquine... Um, it was known, I believe, since 2006 that it was effective against the first SARS virus. So it was a logical thing to use for the next SARS virus, you know, which was not that different. So, I mean, it was also vilified. And, and in fact, I mean, in the U.S., the, the U.S. government bought massive stockpiles of hydroxychloroquine basically to stop the public from being able to get it. They just kind of bought it all up to try and sort of corner the market. Um, and that happened all over the place. Uh, it happened in, in Australia, where, where literally massive stockpiles of it were bought and then just put in a warehouse somewhere. And, 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 and in Australia, they were destroyed. They, they literally had them destroyed. But they desperately did not want people to have other treatments. Um, it, it, was, it was absurd. You know, the fact that they told... It, it didn't take long to figure out what was working for these people with COVID, but to tell people that there was no treatment for it, you must, you know, when you, when you get sick, you isolate yourselves, you stay home and you do nothing until your lips turn blue was murderous. And then, you know, another thing, James, this COVID in people who had made seriously ill, they got a COVID pneumonia. Viral pneumonias almost always have a bacterial component because the virus kind of weakens your immune system and then opportunistic bacteria that are always around us in the environment then start as well. And so usually people with viral pneumonias have a, a bacterial component that needs antibiotics. And the fact that they told me other and other doctors do not use antibiotics for people with COVID pneumonia. It's a virus, not a bacteria. Don't use antibiotics. You're just going to create antibiotic resistance. Was murderous because those antibiotics were life-saving for them. When your immune system is under strain, it needs the help of being able to stop those bacteria from infecting you while you're down. You know, these, these, these opportunistic, they sort of hit you while you're down. And that's why you often get a bacterial co-infection. And so the fact that they told doctors, do not use doxycycline, do not use azithromycin, these were life-saving things. And so this was a systematic program to literally seem to be to cause the maximum harm uh, by, by blocking doctors from doing their job, from spreading this misinformation, and from getting people... I, yeah, I mean, getting people to just, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the 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 thing against ivermectin and calling it horse deworm, of course, it's a horse dewormer. Yeah. But, you know, we give penicillin to horses, but, but that doesn't mean you can't use it for your strep throat, you right. know, just because horses get it too. I mean, it was, it was so evil. It was just terrible. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of evidence that ivermectin is effective against cancer as well. And that, that's another reason why it has been as suppressed as it is, right? Because it's this wonderful miracle drug that seems to have, you know, just multiple purposes, multiple uses that would put a number of other 
much more expensive uh, patented drugs uh, out of business had had people have known how effective it was. So I guess the next step in this is I want to ask, so you're using ivermectin to treat your patients. You're guilty of three major crimes here, right? You care, you're doing science and you're you're working to try to find a solution. Um, what's the, what's the consequence of that for you? Well, well, the consequence is um, so I was I, I was accused of spreading misinformation um, by initially by telling the world what the shots did to my own patients by saying that the, uh, by my D dimer tests by saying this causes microclotting they consider that to be misinformation by saying that it causes neurological injuries. That's misinformation. You know, you wonder what do they think all the strokes and Bell's palsies are if those are not neurological injuries. But anyway, um, th that's misinformation. I, I'm I'm accused of saying this is going to affect fertility in in females. That's misinformation. I'm accused of uh, what is the other thing? I got a, a list here. Um, oh, of of saying that there's a, a large number of people that have died from the COVID shots, which every vaccine injury reporting system across the world has reported that, but you know, they, they, they don't recognize that. Um, I, I'm, I'm accused of um, saying that this is a risk to children, you know, and, and that, that COVID not a serious risk, but the vaccine is a serious risk. The myocarditis, th those are the main things that they, th th that I'll be on trial for next month. Um, for saying those things, because they consider all of that to be misinformation. So, yeah. and then of course, the other thing too, when doctors were banned from prescribing ivermectin, people said, so what do we do? Um, you know, Canada Border Services um, was blocking any ivermectin coming across the border. Um, so people couldn't get it. They could not get prescription ivermectin. And so, I'd said to people, your only option is to use the veterinary ivermectin. It's the same stuff. You know, the stuff that's made in Calgary by Alberta Veterinary Labs, um, that is the liquid solution. Literally, it's got two ingredients. It's a pure ivermectin solution. It's ivermectin in water. It's it's purer than than pills, you know, that, that it, it, because pills have all kinds of other binders and stabilizers and coatings and other things. This is just a pure ivermectin solution. So because I told people to use the non-prescription veterinary ivermectin, they believe I put people at risk for doing that. But I mean, if you look at the number of people who have died from ivermectin, and, and I don't know how they determined that, but you know, out of the 4 billion doses that have been used worldwide, 400 people died. Whereas if you look at how many people have died from Tylenol, um, I think it's 30,000 so far have died from Tylenol um, and 400 from Ivermectin. Um, so, you know, obviously uh, Iver Ivermectin has literally the, the, safety, the, the, the best safety profile of, of any drug on the market. And so for them to tell people that it was dangerous horse dewormer was just absurd because it is literally safer than Tylenol or aspirin or ibuprofen or any of these over-the-counter things. Uh, it's incredibly safe. Um, I don't know how a person would die from it, but but people have died from everything. You know, you can die from eating a peanut. So, um, it drinking happens. water. Yeah, you I mean, can, you can, you can. right? Like, I, I, yeah, I talked to to Pierre Corey about this, and and he said that even that that four hundred number is kind of suspicious. He's not sure how they found that because even in trials where they attempted to overdose it, they were never able to get it to a lethal dose, right? And people who had overdosed on ivermectin, you know, complained of, you know being lightheaded, having, you know, stomach pains or something. But, you know, it was stuff that was, you know, reconciled itself within 24 hours, right? So, yeah. so I want to talk about this, this trial that's about to begin, because now you're guilty of four crimes, right? You're also guilty of telling the truth, which in our world now is misinformation. Um, yeah. So, so let's talk about this trial. What, it, what is going on? What are you, um, what are you up against here? So, so I'm being tried by the, the BC College of Physicians and Surgeons. So this is, yeah, for the, for the crimes that I've, I've mentioned. <laughs> um, so, so, of course, when you're being tried by your accuser, it's unlikely to be unbiased. You know, the, the college is my accuser. 
but they're also the judge, jury, and executioner. So, so I, I don't have a high expectation of justice in this, um, but the tri they're obliged to make these disciplinary trials public. And so um, there's a link that, uh, and, and I, can, I can send you the details for that, that people can apply for a link to observe the trial. And, and so I have got eight brilliant doctors and scientists from around the world who will be testifying to say that they absolutely agree. And one of them, of course, is, is Pierre Corey. Who, and he'll be talking about ivermectin and he'll be talking about shedding because, oh, that's the other crime that I had is that they were trying to vilify the unvaccinated. They were trying to make people hate the unvaccinated. They were trying to claim that the unvaccinated were a danger to society, that they were antisocial, irresponsible, selfish people who were prolonging this pandemic and putting other people at risk. I mean, it was the most amazing hate speech against the unvaccinated. And so, you know, I went on speaking tours, I think through about 50 cities in, in, in mostly in BC, but some in Alberta, um, probably I think eight cities in Alberta, some in a couple in Saskatchewan, two in Ontario. Anyway, I, I, I spoke in a lot of places talking about what was going on. And um, one of the things that I said is that this idea, that this hatred that they are spreading against the unvaccinated is so evil because it is so untrue. And that sadly, in reality, the vaccinated are a risk to the unvaccinated. It's the other way around. It's and the reason why the vaccinated are a risk to the unvaccinated is because the vaccinated all have damaged immune systems. So they are the people who get COVID the most. Over and over again, they get COVID. And so obviously, the more you get COVID, the more you'll spread COVID. So it is the vaccinated who are prolonging this because they just keep getting COVID. But I also spoke about shedding. And, and so that's what Pierre Corey is going to be giving evidence about. Uh, so shedding is this process where your body is trying to get rid of those spike proteins and it comes out in your breath and your skin and your body secretions. And, and so, um, so ivermectin is also really helpful for shedding injuries. I've had lots of people contact me with horrible side effects from being around vaxxed people. For some, you know, for some of them, it's after having sex with a vaxxed person, they now have chest pains and, 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 terrible fatigue and other issues, mental fog. And those are people obviously that are very sensitive to the spike proteins who, who got, they got, or somebody sometimes called, they got shed on um, <laughs> because it's because they got spiked. They got spiked <laughs> through shedding. They got shed on. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, so the ivermectin really helps that. I've had, I had a, a patient who worked as a waitress in a coffee shop. She was unvaxxed. It was before the vax mandates came out because obviously she lost her job after that. She wasn't allowed into the restaurant. But initially, when she was around vax people, she would break out in this terrible rash, which she never got if she didn't go to work or if she was around unvax people. And ivermectin stopped the rash. And other people who would get headaches, migraines, and other things when they were around vax people, which they didn't get when they were not around vax people, ivermectin stopped it. And literally, it's binding those spike proteins. Um, so, so ivermectin is wonderful for, for a multitude of things. And as we've said, incredibly safe. I mean, I, yeah, I had one patient who was using that horse paste and, and took the whole tube, you know, he has, I mean, that's usually for a 600 kilo horse and, and he took and, and anyway, he phoned me up to find out how long he must carry on doing this for. And I said, how much did you take? You know, and I think I worked out he was 50, it was He's a very skinny guy, uh, and 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 I, you know, I worked out this was, I can think about ten times more than he was supposed to have taken, and and when I told him he didn't need any more, that I thought he'd had enough, he was quite upset because if this is brilliant stuff, it's really helped me. <laughs> How can you tell me not to take any more? <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, speaking on the on the mandates, um, I actually wanted to touch on that with you because. So I'm a student of history. I've spent most of my life reading about dictators and dictatorships and all of the brutal, horrific things that have happened uh, in the course of humanity. And um, 
you know, the vaccine mandates really, really reminded me of of Nazi Germany, um, the the vaccine passport specifically, because a lot of people aren't aware. But during Nazi uh, the Nazi period and during the Third Reich, they had what was called an Onen Pass, which was uh, a passport that you had to carry if you were an Aryan citizen of German uh, in Germany. And basically, it was your papers that stated that you were of pure Aryan blood. Therefore, you could access entertainment venues and and rail cars and that sort of thing because uh, you know by that point uh Jews were were basically stricken from public life i mean it, it happened pretty quickly once once hitler was appointed chancellor he removed Jews from all matters of of public life uh pretty much right away uh and the vaccine passport reminded me of that immediately i mean it was the exact same scenario it was a what they did with the vaccine mandates would have made himmler proud you know, and so you're from South Africa originally, and and did you spot any similarities between the vaccine passport system, what was happening with unvaccinated people, the way that they were being painted by the media and by, well, politicians, our governments and public health? Uh, was there any similarity between that and, and what you witnessed during apartheid? Absolutely. So apartheid was also, it was a system based on this Nazi idea of the purity of the races, where they believed that, so in South Africa, it was illegal for a Caucasian person to marry a black person or a person of mixed race or a person of East Indian origin or whatever. You were not allowed to marry that person because the races had to be kept pure. And they had three different classes of citizens. If you were Caucasian, you were a first class citizen and you had a vote and you could live wherever you wanted. If you were East Indian, Chinese or of mixed race, you were a second class citizen and you did not have a vote and you could only live in areas designated for those groups. And if you were black, you were a third class citizen and you got the worst of the worst. And so... They had different schools, different hospitals, different, um, you know, you got different health care de depending on which group you were in. Uh, even a black doctor would not be allowed to work in a white hospital because he was black. Uh, white doctors could work anywhere. White people could go anywhere, live anywhere. Uh, they had all the privilege and they were the only ones that had votes. So one of the things that black people had to do is they were restricted to where they had to be. So they had to carry something called a pass. And, and what a pass was, was, was um, it was a little book, like a little ID book that was allowed them to go into white areas or areas that were not designated as black areas. And without this, they would be arrested. They would be put in jail and then deported back to their what the government called homelands and the government made we were a bit like reserves these homelands uh they, they were the government just got these sort of rundown areas areas that other people didn't really want these people got sent to live there they were, it was like the reserve system um so so this these vaccine passports which enabled you to play sport or to go to a restaurant or in South Africa, black people were not allowed into a cinema unless it was a cinema designated for black people, of which I think there was one in the entire country. Uh, they were not allowed into restaurants unless there were a waiter waiting at the table. In other words, they could be there as a servant, but they may not eat in that restaurant. They weren't, as I say, they couldn't they couldn't buy property wherever they wanted to. It had to be in an area. This they couldn't enroll in educational institutions. So what we saw against the unvaxxed, where they were prevented from education, they were prevented from um, restaurants, cinemas, travel, all of these things was exactly the same as apartheid South Africa. And it was, you know, Canada was one of the countries that opposed this in South Africa back in the because apartheid in South Africa only ended in 1994. Most people don't realize that. And Canada actively opposed it, but yet did exactly the same things to its own citizens through these vaccine passports. And of course, uh, you know, as you mentioned, the Nazis did this too. Um, 
But what was so evil about what Canada was doing? Obviously, if you were a black person in South Africa, you can't change the color of your skin. You're black. That's it. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in Canada, all you had to do was go and get vaccinated. And then you would be in the privileged class. And so it was a very, very evil way of coercing people into having this injection that they didn't want, they didn't trust, and they didn't need. Yeah. But so many people did it because they wanted to go and watch their son play hockey, or they wanted to visit grandma in the old age home, or whatever it was. It, this was so evil. It was, you know, it's actually against the law. There was a Supreme Court ruling, I think it was in 1980, that basically makes informed consent obligatory no one is allowed you're not allowed to force anybody to have a medical treatment that they do not want for any reason and, and this is medical treatments and even medical tests are supposed to be voluntary they, they, you know these people who were told even if they didn't have a vaccine mandate to go to work that they had to test themselves for covid three times a week or something even that is illegal yeah. You're not allowed to force somebody to have a medical test they don't want. Yeah. And yet the medical profession just went along with this. I mean, this is brain. It, it just, I, I don't know, it made me very, very sad that so few people who really should know better had so little moral integrity that they just rolled over and just went along with it. Absolutely. I mean, I'll share with you a bit of my story, you know, so I'm I'm Métis. I'm, my mom is Plains Cree Indian. I've been subject to some fairly poor treatment at times in my life. You know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky in the way that I don't look Indian. So uh, I'm, I've been able to kind of transcend between groups. But in circumstances where people did know, I was definitely treated differently. Um, I remember standing in a park eating lunch with my wife and children because we weren't allowed in the restaurant. And it began to rain. And this was when I was still living in Vancouver. And I was sitting there thinking to myself, this is probably the lowest I've ever felt in my life. And it's because I made a choice to protect my family from a experiment that I was not going to let them be a part of. And it was in that moment we decided to leave Alberta or leave British Columbia and move to Alberta. Um, now, interestingly enough, um, a year later, my um, my mother-in-law contracts sepsis from a blood transfusion as part of her cancer treatment that was given to her by the BC healthcare system, believe it or not. And she went into a coma and was clinging to life. It was her last cancer treatment, so she was incredibly frail. And no, she was not in the physical condition that you would, you know, ideally want somebody to contract sepsis in, right? And... We had to get back to Vancouver and my wife took a bus twice uh, because she was unvaccinated. She couldn't get on an airplane and it was just too long of a trip. And so we got to a point where we had no choice. We had to be able to get on an airplane. So me and my wife both got the first dose of Novavax. I did not take an mRNA injection. I took Novavax just so I could get on an airplane. If I had the choice, I would have never taken any of them. But interestingly, um, a week after I took the first dose of Novavax, my heart went absolutely insane in my chest, something I've never felt before. I have a heart arrhythmia, um, but this was not that. I, I know the way my arrhythmia feels. My heart was beating at like a million BPMs in shallow beats, felt like it was seizing in my chest. Um, worst part about it is I've never talked to a doctor about it, like privately. I've talked to you about it now, and I think I mentioned it to Pierre Corey. Um, but because I don't trust our system, I don't trust that whatever happened to me will be accurately diagnosed. And my main worry is that I'll receive a misdiagnosis to kind of throw me off of the trail of a vaccine injury, and then I'll be treated for something I don't even have. And that's the situation that we're in here in Canada now. Right, right. Yeah, no, it's, it's terrible. And, and you know, what, what you're saying is what I've heard from so many people who literally don't trust the medical system anymore. They feel betrayed by the medical system that just was complicit in all of these crimes against humanity that we've spoken about. The 
the the coercion and the fear and the discrimination and and the cover up of the evidence of harm and the withholding medical treatment and on and on the the medical profession unfortunately is is very guilty more than any other this has been a a, a medical tyranny that we have been in and so the, the medical profession is the most guilty of all because they really should have known better. And, and it's very sad. I mean, there've been times where I've always been ashamed to be a doctor because I'm ashamed of my profession, that, that so few of them had enough moral integrity. Even when they could see these things were wrong, they just kept silent. And, you know, all that it all that is needed for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. And the majority of them did nothing because they were more concerned about themselves and their own well-being than, than others, which is very, very sad when people are so selfish that they will risk nothing to protect others. Yeah. And, you know, every action has a reaction, right? And, you know, going back to apartheid, what we're seeing now in South Africa is a rise of a political movement that is actively terrorizing the white population and white farmers. And they look to be the group that will form the next government in South Africa, which is paralyzing, right? I mean, do you have any thoughts on that? No, I mean it, it. It's tragic. Um, you know, I love South Africa, and I and I go back there periodically. I still have a lot of family there. Um, but it, yeah, it is it is tragic. Yeah, the the injustices and the the discrimination there against white people is 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 horrible. Um, right. You know, discrimination against anyone is absolutely unforgivable. We all need to be treated as equals um and and i just never yeah it's just try i just never thought i would hear it out of the the mouth well our own prime minister i mean i've never heard any you know, he he's very quick to, to 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 accuse others of hate speech but i've never heard such terrible hatred against the unvaccinated you know that people thought they should be denied medical care that they should just be allowed to die you know that sort of thing. It was it was it was really sad that that people would dis one doesn't expect that of Canadians. You know, Canadians, yeah. you, you have an expectation that they're going to be kind and tolerant, and 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 we saw anything but. We, we just it it didn't seem to take much to to bring out the absolute worst in people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I, I've always I've always found that a lot of that, you know, well, especially what we're seeing. I mean, prime minister, our prime minister, Justin Trudeau, is a prime example of this. But a lot of the compassion and tolerance, it's it's kind of worn as a as a virtue. Right. It's not it's not real. It's not genuine. The the compassion and tolerance is genuine is in people like you who sacrificed everything to help people, you know, like it. That's the part about all this that has really messed me up is, you know, you're about to go on trial. You're you're you face a potential of losing your medical license. Am I correct? Yes, that is correct. And throughout this entire story of yours, you never did anything malicious to anybody. In fact, what you were doing was the opposite. You were trying to save lives and figure out why you were being prevented from doing so. And, you know, I, when I talked to Pierre Corey, he said that, you know, I read his four-part defense of you. And he said that when he read your story and heard about what was happening to you, he was so fired up that he just sat down and started writing. And he went way deeper than he thought he would because he started, he was just so angry at what was happening to you. And the fact that you, you know, you're one of the few rare you're one of the rare few good doctors out there still. You know, you're not a cog in a machine. You're not part of a faceless machine that's just, you know, pumps people in, pumps people out and generates profits for big pharma, right? You're you're an actual real doctor. And so, you know, when I talked to him, I, I, I didn't reach out to you earlier just because you live in Lytton and typically people who live in smaller rural communities want to be left alone. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to, 
I'm going to do Dr. Hoff a favor and leave him alone. I'm not going to bug him. But after I talked to, to Dr. Corey, I was like, I absolutely have to talk to Dr. Hoff. And I'm really glad that we had this conversation today because, you know, I'm, I'm just so glad you're, you're out there, you know, like you, you are one of the rare few people that like give me faith in this system of ours that, that someday, somehow, some way I may be lucky enough to be treated by somebody like you who genuinely cares whether I live or die. And so I want to conclude by talking about this trial because so who is who's prosecuting you? Is it the province of British Columbia or is it the BC College of Physicians and Surgeons or is it both? No, it's not the province. I have not broken any laws. I have not committed any crimes except in the eyes of the college. Um, and, and, you know, I've spoken about what they hold against me. So so they 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 generate a panel, a disciplinary panel. And I believe, um, so two of the people on that panel are doctors, including the, the head of the panel, um, which is who her name is Darlene Hamill. So she's the head of the disciplinary panel. Um, one of them is a retired judge. Um, and one of them is just a random member of the public. And I think one is a legal a lawyer or so, something like that. And then, of course, they have a team of lawyers as well, which advise them. So this is a group of five people who will be trying me. Um, the college has one expert witness. I mentioned I've got eight. They have one who was Dr. Bonnie Henry's right-hand man during the first um, two years of the pandemic in BC. Uh, so he is, um, he's basically a family doctor who has specialized in, pu in, in public health. Um, so, so of course he's not really qualified to talk about microclotting and fertility issues and the neurovascular problems and all of these other things. Um, and so, but, but of course this isn't really a, a fair trial because I'm being tried by my accusers. Um, so anyway, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Um, they're obliged to make these trials public so that anybody can apply to the BC College for a link. And we would love as many people as possible to do that because they need to know the world is watching them. They're they are always concerned about public opinion. And of course, they have the media on their side who will defame me, you know, as, as they've done all along. Um, and, you know, the media are not exactly honest or unbiased because we know who pays them. So, um, so people can apply for a link, but they have to do it at least 10 days before the trial. And and so I'll I'll send you a link for where people can get it. But so so part of this is even if you don't have time to watch much of it or or, or at all because it's going over many days, the college needs to know that they are being watched um, because I've got as I mentioned eight brilliant people who are going to be setting out fantastic evidence that the world needs to see, and um, so. So that's what's happening in this trial. Dr. Mark Trozzi, who's an emergency room doctor from Ontario, also had a disciplinary trial a couple of months ago. He got the, the outcome of that a few weeks ago. He lost his medical license and was fined $95,000. So this exactly the same thing could happen to me with this trial. But effectively, public health is being put on trial because my expert witnesses and my lawyer are literally going to reveal all of the misinformation and the ethical breaches of public health in this pandemic. So we'll see what happens. But, um, you know, the other way that, that, that I would be grateful if anyone could help if they can is by making a financial contribution for paying the lawyers. Um, I, I have a brilliant lawyer um, who's from Kelowna, BC, um, who is very, he's defending many medical professionals, not just doctors, nurses, psychologists, others. Um, and he seems to be probably the top lawyer in this 
realm in in Canada, in my opinion. Um, and his name is Lee Turner, and so, but but he he has had to recruit other lawyers and lots of legal aids, and these people need to be paid. Um, they have families to feed, um, and so 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 there's a if people put in my name at Give Send Go. There's a link there where you can make a donation that will go towards my my legal defense. And if people would like to have um, a tax receipt, then you can donate through um, the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms, the JCCF. But they have to specify there that it's for me. Otherwise, it will not go to me. It will go to whatever the Justice Center is doing at the time. So so those are the two ways that people can support through, through giving. And of course, they can support through, through through getting a link and observing it. And they can support by sending letters of complaint to the college that they have literally lost their moral compass, that they are persecuting the most ethical, upstanding doctors is absurd. And, and so, of course, be, so I, I can also send you a link where people can... Um, to tell them where to send the letters to, but at, at the they, the college has a complaints website. They mostly just ignore these things. So I encourage people to just keep resending your complaint every week until they respond, until they actually acknowledge it, uh, because they just ignore it. They seem to think they're immune to uh, to criticism. But all of this shows them that public opinion is not in their favor. Well, they're immune because they're vaccinated, right? Um, that was a bad joke. <laughs> um, when is when is what is your when is your trial date? When does it start? It starts March fourth, March fourth, and yeah, and it's for ten days, so it'll go Monday to Friday for for two weeks in a row, and and maybe longer. We'll see what happens. Okay, this might not be released before that date, so if it isn't, what I'm going to do is I'm going to clip out um, this last ten minutes, and I will publish that so that people people please look. I I know that it's easy for us to just sit back and listen to a podcast and get outraged about what's happening uh, to people like Dr. Charles Hoff. But in this scenario, we need to get involved. You need to do what Dr. Hoff is asking. Um, if we let doctors like Charles Hoff be sacrificial lambs for this disgusting, grotesque experiment that we were all forced to partake in, there's no limit to what they will do going forward. We, we are literally saying, we are okay with this. Please continue. This is how we fight back. And and Dr. Charles Hoff has taken the, the burden of a lot of this on himself. And I mean, your medical license, everything that you've worked for, I mean, for yourself, I mean, being a medical doctor, I mean, that's that's a huge achievement in life to be a medical doctor, to be somebody who saves lives and, and helps people. And you've helped... I mean, I, I can only imagine how many thousands and tens of thousands of lives you've touched throughout your lifetime. So everybody, the links are in the description where you can go and and contribute to his defense. Uh, also go and sign up to watch. I will be watching it. If this is not published before uh, Dr. Hoff's trial date, th This you will be seeing this video on X and and Rumble and everywhere else because I want people to know uh, to do this. So if this episode does not premiere before the trial date you're watching a clip right now I'm, I'm 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 asking all of you please go out and and just do your part i it's it's so important that we that we surround people like you and let the system know that it's not okay it's not okay for them to do what they're trying to do to you um dr hoff i i have so many more questions but i i feel like we'll sit here for another two hours and I'll just run you into the ground to the point where you can't think anymore. So um, we'll cut it here. Is there anywhere else, uh, any other links, any anywhere else that anybody can find more information on your case and, and the things that are happening? Uh, no, yeah, I don't have a website. Um, I don't have, yeah, I don't, uh, that's one of the, that, that's one of the um, accusations against me is that I've posted misinformation on social media. So I think I'm probably one of the few people in Canada that has never in my life ever put anything on social media ever. Um, and so, <laughs> so I, when I saw that accusation against me, I just laughed. I thought, boy, oh boy, they're searching for things to, 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 <laughs> to <laughs> accuse me. 
So I better keep that like that. You know, I, I, you know, I've never, I don't have a LinkedIn page. I don't have a, uh, you know, I don't, I've never been on, on Twitter or on Facebook or anything. So, so no, it, it, I rely on people like you, James, just to record what I say and, and you put it out there and then they can't accuse me of it. <laughs> well, you're a better man for staying out of that cesspool. Um, I, I that's five crimes I counted now. You're also guilty of not having social media. That's that's a big crime, man. Um, <laughs> a terrible crime, yeah. <laughs> well, Dr. Charles Hoff, thank you so much for your time. Um, you know, I I've said this probably a billion times. I've said it to every doctor who stood up uh, throughout this pandemic. But thank you. You know, without without you taking the risk and gambling like you did. Um, people like me, what we would have never known, you know, and that's the part that's the most scary is that it took your bravery and the bravery of a small handful of other doctors to stand up and say, no, this isn't right. And we're going to fight and we're going to be loud. And you can take my license if you want, uh, in order for people like me to, to recognize what was happening and to be able to protect my family. So, uh, Dr. Hoff, just through speaking out and, being a voice, you've saved more lives than you know. So thank you, sir. Well, you're most welcome, James. Thank you. I wish you well.